Flo Anderson, thank you very, very much for your time this morning um, and to learn a little bit more about your business and all the great things that you're involved with in the rural space. Um, you um, have you know, several businesses that you're involved in, the Goods Group and the Rural Business Collective, and really looking forward to get to know a little bit more about these businesses, but very particularly about, you know, your uh, strategies and the, the great things, how you achieve, what you achieve, and so forth. Mm. Hi, Reza. Um, yeah, thanks for having me on. Happy to, um, to share a few stories about what, um, what I get up to. Uh, I first and foremost am a, a, a cotton farmer enrolled in two family farming operations in central Queensland and in the Darling Downs. And um, I, I grew up on the Darling Downs on a cotton farm there and with the family that were involved in a number of different businesses over the years. Um, but fast forward to today, um, the way I, I have a few different hats as you sort of alluded to, but the way I like to think of it is that um, I have the, the Cahoots Group, which is my mothership is how I describe it. And so the mothership is where everything that all the little bits and pieces sit neatly underneath. Neath. And the mothership has a certain criteria and certain values and things that are personal to me and what I want out of my um, career and, and business life. And so the businesses that fall underneath that need to all, you know, be part of that, the Cahoots Group. Um, so at the moment under Cahoots Group, I sort of split my life up into a, a couple of different, uh, I call them projects and maybe that's just to make them sound a little bit more manageable, but <laughs> I suppose they are. Um, there's there's the, um, the Rural Business Collective, which was launched in um, 2016 and that's a, a, a membership organisation that's there to support um, people wanting to do business from rural areas, rural and remote areas, which should be very familiar to anyone and interested in this WIRE program. Um, we sort of have a lot of similar values there. Um, but it, it, it's a community in itself um, that also has some uh, deliveries of products and services underneath it. Then we have um, the, the communications agency that I have been running that one since 2008 um, in various um, stages of flow depending on ages of children and, and stages of farms and things like that. Um, but we're certainly in a bit of a growth phase with it at the moment and it's a, a comms digital strategy um, agency there where we work with clients, um, particularly specialising in rural communities and businesses with a rural fit footprint, mm -hmm. helping them with their communication strategies and, and digital um, integrations and those sorts of things. Um, and then the, 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 the next part of the pie there is myself as a, as a business. So there would be my, um, as a, um, my skills as a director um, and being invited to speak at events and, and seeing those sorts of things. So I sort of keep that um, separate as my personal um, brand there. And, um, and then the, just recently as an offshoot from Cahoots is we have a um, Cahoots radio service. So that's tapping into the podcasting um, that we've been doing a lot of and getting a lot of um, response from other people. So we'll come and do... Um, conference radio we call it so coming out to conferences and things and producing podcasts and audio content for other people um, so that's that's sort of the breadth of things at the moment and um, the all feeding up into this main drive um, for the Cahoots group which is creating opportunity in rural and remote Australia whether that's opportunity through employment or opportunity through business growth Oh, look, I think it's fantastic, um, especially the fact that you're really tapping into the virtual space and the digital mm. and, um, you know, just in the recent um, uh, survey that we've done as well, a lot of women out there have kind of, they, they see the internet as, as quite a, you know, barrier and so forth. And you're obviously navigating your way just really well around that. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about that later uh, mm. in this interview. Um, I guess what I'd like to know from you, how do you see yourself, um, your identity within all of these uh, various aspects of your businesses. Do you see yourself as an entrepreneur or how do you identify, you know, what would your identity be in this space? 
Yeah, look, I do, I do see myself as an entrepreneur or probably just more broadly as a businesswoman. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess my definition of entrepreneur is that someone that seeks opportunity and acts upon that opportunity um, and has a flexible and fast-flowing way of approaching um, approaching businesses and opportunities. So that's sort of how I view entrepreneur. I don't think um, I belong in necessarily the, the explicit startup community. I don't see myself as um, someone that's interested in um, high, high growth scale outside of investment as my core driver. Um, some of businesses that I have do have a path, a vision for them that they will be sold um, or that they do attract investment, but that's not what drives me. Um, certainly what drives me is about creating a business in something that I'm passionate about and that I enjoy personally and that I feel I can make a contribution to. Um, and, and I guess that's probably my identity tied up in that is that I, um, I, I, I have some strong drivers and values of, for myself and so I see uh, myself as, um, I guess, an, a person that's on... Um, an advocate, I guess, for those particular things. And I like to find business opportunities that can help achieve that mission and goal. Okay. So, you know, you, you talk about, um, uh, you know, all of this is part of your part of your journey. Um, so what would be the kind of mindset that you think is has really helped you a lot in actually achieving what you have achieved up to now? Um, look, there's probably a few things that get you through different phases and different stages of what you're doing. And I, I at the moment, have got a business that's been established for 10 years, one that's been established for one year, um, and ones that are in the process of investigating and launch. So the mindset, sometimes it's hard to shift between those different phases of a project. But um, I guess the one thing that gets me through, and I always say is that the vision and the mission is, is solid, that doesn't change, but the vehicle I choose to get there may change and will change often. So if I start out on a path with a certain business and it might change tact, I might get six months into it and go, you know, I don't know if this is actually taking me to the, the, the end goal anymore um, or I've talked to somebody and I've realised that's not the intended consequence of that, I can change that vehicle and, and shape that as I go but the vision and mission sort of stay stay pretty solid. So what does success mean to you? Success to me um, is certainly about a lot of lifestyle kind of things come into my vision of success. Uh, for me, um, the farm is always uh, for us, and when I say us, it's my family. So when I, I see myself, these goals are uh, goals that I'm working towards on behalf of my family as my contribution. Um, and and success to me is the farm has to come first to us to me. Um, that is our our true love, I guess, and that is what we will always want to see for the long term for our children and that, that's our legacy is, is the farm. And so any decisions that I make have to be um, aligned with the implications that it might have on the farm. So there's some things that just might sound great but I just simply won't follow them because I don't think that the, the impact on the farm is going to be worth it. Um, so success to me is having a, a strong... Um, farm base and a strong um, base for our family. So that's our, our foundation piece. If that's all humming along well and I have the freedom to pursue some of these ideas without barriers, um, that I have the freedom to, to pursue ideas that spark my interest and that I'm pursuing them not just for the, for the, love, of, for the love of money um, but for that personal satisfaction and creating that lifestyle and things that I can engage my family in, that's, um, that's probably success for me. Uh, you mentioned an in interesting aspect and that's the, the mission and the vision. Um, mm. Have you had this kind of mindset of the vision, mission right from the start, like when you started your first business or was that something that kind of became more important to you as you kind of progressed on your journey? I've always probably been a very values-based okay. person, um, probably personality-wise from a very young child. Um, and so there's probably two parts that come into that has been I've been a very values-based person, so I've only can subscribe to something that I personally align with. 
Um, and, and that might, you know, that's probably been evident if you ask my mum and dad probably since I was a kid. Um, and then the, uh, the other side of it is that I've also, I probably started doing a lot of competitive sport when I was a kid and got involved. You know, I had a sports psychologist and all that sort of stuff. And so we were very focused on goal setting. And so I think the combination of those two things has resulted in me. I, I'm pretty, um, yeah, guided in that way. Yeah. So there's a lot of skills that's involved in the, in building an entrepreneurial journey. Uh, what do you think are the skills that really helped you in your journey? Yeah, well, there's some that's helped me and some that I wish I had and would have helped me probably. Um, there's a fair few gaps in the skill set. I think a lot of us, particularly as entrepreneurs, we probably um, embark on these exercises because we have a, a technical skill or a particular certain skill that makes us um, a unique or get, positions us in the best spot to take advantage of an opportunity. Um, but there's the whole stack underneath it that um, need a bit of filling in, in the gaps. So I think for me, I'm, I'm pretty good at planning. I'm a, I'm a pretty good planner. So I, and I think that comes from that strategy uh, mindset that I have. So I think my ability um, and skill in, in strategy and planning is pretty strong. Um, and I also think that probably um, my ability to, to, to build rapport and communicate with others is, is quite strong. So I can, um, you know, for better or for worse, um, talk to people and get them engaged in the idea early in the piece. Um, so I think that's important. And those, that probably, those two things probably both speak to, I guess, a certain level of leadership skills. I think that, you know, that might necessarily be a leader. I might necessarily be a leader as such, but I, I think those leadership skills certainly help drive a business. Um, some of the other, I'm quite disciplined um, as well, which I think is really probably critical. Um, and that might come back from the competitive sport <laughs> as a child too. That discipline, I think, is probably the difference. Um, I've worked from home for, you know, 10 years. Um, and a lot of people have sort of said, oh, I can't work from home. I get too distracted and things like that. Well, I, I find it quite the opposite. I... Um, I quite enjoy zoning in in my own space here. I've got no distractions, um, whereas, um, yeah, so I'm quite disciplined with my working at home. It, it's probably a bit of a problem when you work from home from the opposite end of the scale, not that I get distracted, but that um, the office is always right here so I can just sneak in after dinner and do a bit of work and the next thing it's 1 o'clock in the morning, um, which you wouldn't have if you worked away from home. So probably, yeah, the discipline, communication skills, the ability to articulate a clear strategy and vision for the business of being in three things that have probably helped me um, get things off the ground. And then I've needed to very quickly um, back that up with the skill sets of um, getting someone that's a fantastic at that administration finance piece under me. That's usually my first hire. And then my second hire will, will be someone around... Um, some of the more regular pieces, like um, at the moment, you know, I'm putting people in around me in terms of content um, curation and and getting that day-to-day -day stuff going so I can continue doing partnerships and business development and that sort of stuff. So you obviously have a team kind of working with you, whether you contract them in and so forth. Do you, um, what, what's your view on like uh, uh, entrepreneurs' um, strength? And, and do you kind of have a view that it's important to use your strength or develop everything in your, you know, or do you kind of contract out what you're not strong into? Like what, yeah. what's your views or view on that? I always go with play, play to your strengths and manage your weaknesses. I don't, um, I don't beat myself up anymore about not being great at everything. I used to and it really held me back. So I found that I was spending a lot of time early in the piece, um, you know, probably in my first entrepreneurial activity, which would have been about, uh, I'm going to say, 15, 12 to 15 years ago, um, I tried to be everything. And so what I would do is when I found a weakness, I would go and spend a lot of time, resources and effort in skilling myself up in that weakness um, and while I'm doing that, I'm robbing myself of all the power that I have in the other areas that are actually 
you know, providing a lot of advantage. So I was trying to craft this all singing, all dancing kind of entrepreneur early in the piece. And, um, you know, when you're bootstrapping businesses and when you're really trying to start them off on the smell of an oily rag, um, it is good to be across a whole heap of things. Uh, but I find that it's much, you can get get cracking a lot faster and, um, you know, get to where you want to go a lot faster if you can identify the key weaknesses that you have in your business or the key things that keep, um, you know, the, the things that you get up in the morning and you go, oh, God, I'm not, you know, I know I've got to do that. The thing on your to-do list that keeps getting written on the next page and the next page because it keeps carrying over, um, I've learnt to identify those things pretty quickly and try and put someone in that place for me. Flair, who would be somebody that you admire in the entrepreneurial space and why? Oh, so many, so many, so many people. And um, I think I'm not a massive fan of um, gurus, you know. I, I don't believe in sort of having one poster child that I hang up and I follow the so-and-so method or the I'm a disciple of that particular um, guru and there's a lot of them out at the moment and I find it a little bit noisy, that space. Um, there seems to be someone telling me that, the top 10 ways to, you know, crack through whatever it is all the time. Um, I, so I'm sort of not, not necessarily a, a follow one particular guru, but I'm, I'm constantly looking at everything and picking up bits and pieces from everyone depending on what area I'm looking at. So, you know, in terms of communicating authentically and creating a great personal brand, I might look to someone like Danielle Laporte, even though... My brand is completely different to hers. I very much respect the way she's um, created her brand and driven her business. Um, when I look at people that are sh good decision makers and, and great simple businesses, I might look to someone like Seth Godin. Um, uh, who else? When I think about um, mindset and, and those sorts of things and the ability to really f um, focus with some um, unbreakable force, I might look to somebody like... Um, I don't, like Bob Proctor or someone like that. But I like to take a little bit from each of those and, um, yeah, and then still try and beat to the, dance to the beat of my own drum a bit as well. Do you believe that there's some kind of sort of pattern or formula that's um, important to kind of follow to become a successful entrepreneur? And what would that be, you know? Yeah, that's such a good question, Ruth, and it's something that I probably talk to a few people about and we debate over, you know, wines and one, one Friday night, whether we think there's a particular way to it or not. I don't. I personally don't think there is. I think there's a nice alchemy of, of skills and traits that coincide with a certain point in time and a, and a certain idea that creates this magical, um, magical thing that happens. Um, but I don't... You know, I, I personally, um, and, and I know there's lots of schools of thought out there, I don't personally believe that there's a step one, two, three, four, and you've created a, a perfect business. Mm -hmm. And you might find that you find a step one, two, three, four kind of system and you get some great success in the short term. But I think to create long-term success, that's probably not where you're going to find it. It has to be something more about um, the, the what's in you and what's in your um, ability to your drive and your, and your discipline. Yeah. You, you mentioned qualities there. So, so what would be the kind of qualities that you see as, you know, is really important, are really important? Uh, the qualities certainly, um, uh, uh, the innovation, mindset like the ability to just sort of see opportunity and identify those sorts and look at new ways I think that's certainly important um, definitely the abundance kind of mentality I think is really important that you're not constantly looking at your competitors but you're actually saying there's enough room for all of us here and I'm gonna paddle my own canoe and I'm gonna take you know build others up with me I think that certainly is a great quality to have as an entrepreneur um, and um, the the other ones is definitely that still that that discipline thing that we touched on before. I think that's certainly that you've got to have, um, and also that that passion and conviction. You know, you've got to have real buy-in about what you're doing because 
it's no, it's not the easy way to go. I mean, the amount of conversations I've had around our dinner table with the, you know, I had a, um, I took a job for a few years that paid very, very well, um, and it nearly destroyed me. <laughs> but we did it at a time, we did it at a time where we needed to because um, uh, it was we just recovered from two floods. My husband and I were both self-employed and. It wasn't necessarily financially, but it was the pressure. We were feeling under a fair bit of stress. My husband was feeling a lot of pressure to keep things going. And just mentally, me having a job seemed to help that family unit and help. it was good for us to get back up on our feet. Um, it, you know, mentally, you feel better prepared to take higher risks again. We, we our, our risk profile took a real, um, our ability to take risk took a real hit in an event like a like that where we lost um, lost two crops. Um, so that, that was nice, but, gee, it was hard to wean ourselves off that security um, of that wage afterwards. But ultimately when I um, quit that job to go back, I knew that that was because my personality is better suited to being self-employed and to that entrepreneurial kind of activity and environment. I'm, I, I'm, I'm much happier there. Um, yeah, but it's certainly not the easiest way to go. We'd be um, a lot, um, you know, it's not always, it's not easy. So you certainly have, um, you know, a lot of, uh, I guess, setbacks in on the farm side, but surely you've had some setbacks in your entrepreneurial journey as well. Um, could you maybe think about maybe just one of them and how did you overcome that and how do you overcome it when you kind of hit a wall and you're thinking, how the heck am I going to get through this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Probably some of my biggest setbacks have been in, um, what would be one? Look, I think I'm a, I, and again, it's about those weaknesses, those weak areas and not um, probably valuing them and being on top of them as I should be. Um, so I am not necessarily a fantastic budgeter or things change so fast that I need to be reforecasting my budgets a lot more than what I do. Um, and so probably some of the bigger things have been, um, you know, I've, I've, I've accounted or banked on um, too early on things that, you know, like say a government partnership or a funding program or some sort of gig that was going to be quite substantial. I, have, I bank on that very early and I plan for it and I, you know, skill up or, or scale up to meet that challenge before it was locked in um, and sometimes that has a small impact and other times that impact can be pretty big. Um, and I, yeah, so, so that's probably more from that and that's had a real damage on cash flow and particularly when you've got staff to employ, um, the pressure of having uh, staff and making sure you're always meeting their needs first um, is certainly something. So I have forecasted for a, a rap, quite a large sort of government program that then took a bit of a turn and, and they changed the process of it and it ended up not being exactly what they said it was going to be originally, um, which is really, in hindsight, no big surprise. But at that time I had mentally, you know, I'd mentally spent that money before it was even in the bank. Um, so I had to pull back, you know, regroup, go through, tighten some, go through and do some real cost-cutting measures um, to get through that and focus my attention on quickly finding another another client to fill that hole. Um, and so that just really threw me out and probably put me in the hole for probably about three months um, until we got back on track. But in my kind of business, I guess a lot of it is I don't have huge capital to outlay, so that certainly helps, um, helps there. So it's not like I've had to go and um, purchase large plant and machinery and equipment and things like that and have repayments sitting there. Um, my biggest commitment is probably my my wages bill and my tech, my, my technology subscriptions and things like that. So um, that's something you can kind of get over and dig into the emergency fund that dwindles down, dwindle down pretty bloody quickly when I every time I launch a new business. Um, it always takes me longer to get the systems running than I think it's going to. Um, that happens every time without fail and I still don't curb my planning to accommodate that. I still think that it's going to not take as long as it does. Um, and I've probably some, some bad hiring decisions. I've had some 
I've hired in the past someone that I I really have appreciated this. I've I'd hired on on their um, and everyone tells you you hire on their attitude, hire on fit, hire on their commitment, all that sort of stuff. And so I have you know someone was amazingly committed. I loved their work ethic. I loved the, everything that they did, but they simply didn't have the skills for the role. And then I ended up you know I ended up paying probably three times more than I had to because it was taking them a really long time to get things done and being the perfectionists that they were, they would then spend extra time going down this rabbit warren. And um, so that was a little bit of a, that's been a bit of a lesson there. And hiring staff and managing staff is something that I, it, that's, again, not my strong suit, but I want it to be. Um, and that's something that I really need to, to work on to get to my goals. And ha mentally, how do you push through this? Because, you know, sometimes you, mm -hmm. hit the, you do hit the wall a bit and you think, I don't know if I can do this. And mm -hmm. the entrepreneurs doubt themselves a lot. How do you kind of push through that self-doubt? Yeah, totally. That's probably the biggest um, thing that, that's probably the bigger risk to your business than the cash flow. Mm -hmm. um, th that mental part where you just about to jump and then you go, oh, start, the little, the little voice starts and says, I don't know if you're really up to this. I don't know if this is going to happen. What if, what if, what if? Um, I call them the yeah buts. You know, you get yeah, but what if this happens? Yeah, but. And um, I, I try to, I guess, to just counteract that with what's the worst thing that can happen? So play out that worst possible scenario and is that actually that bad? What would be some things you'd have to do? And once you sort of war game a little bit, war game that, that worst situation, then I just shelve that, forget about that. You've already war game that and you know that you can survive that. Now get back into that positive mindset. I think the devil's advocate thing can really stop people and it's not productive in a workplace or in a business um, I used to be a massive devil's advocate and always throwing that in and it doesn't, it's, I don't think it's productive. Um, so I guess it's pushing that, those doubt things to the side, remembering why you're there, taking a few minutes to just regroup, remembering why you're doing what you're doing, um, looking at the worst thing and just putting your big girl pants on and having a go. There's a <laughs> everything, you know, that's that saying, you know, everything you've ever wanted is on the other side of fear and, and it sounds really cliche but it's so true. It's, um, you know, once you've done it a couple of times too and I guess that's why entrepreneurs get so addicted to that lifestyle as well as because there's nothing better than that feeling of thinking that you can't do it and then putting the big girl pants on and pushing through it. Um, that feeling on the other side where you've done that and then you're in this whole new level, you've broken through that tier and now you've reached this level, that's your new normal that you thought you could never do before. That's that's pretty damn addictive, that's um, the feeling. Networking, so I'd spent a bit of time outside the, the loop as such and then when I came back in, I had to work really hard to re-establish those connections. When I started Rural Business Collective, it's very easy to get caught up in the particularly when you're working remotely and working from home and working where networking and and, and working with other people is hard work because it usually involves a couple of hour drive no matter what you want to do and where you want to go I live, I live in a town of 400 people and all of the people that i work with aren't are at least two hour drive from from, from me um, so it's very easy to get caught up in the office doing all of the back end stuff and being um, keeping yourself very busy um, you know I was incredibly busy but I was probably just busy with activity not necessarily busy with outcome um, and I was spending a lot of time in the back end of Rural Business Collective and, and getting a lot of things sort of planned and right and everything but not getting out and about as much as I should have um, and that's something that I still struggle with is how to balance that getting the nitty-gritty stuff done at home and actually getting out and about or working with um, you know, a lot of that relationship development work um, because it is time consuming um, and it does take time. And I thoroughly enjoy that part of the part of it. So it's very easy for me to get lost in a road trip, visiting people and getting all that sort of stuff done and going to events and speaking at events and, and doing all of those sort of networking things are very easy for me and I really enjoy that. Um, but I have to remind myself that every time I do that, I'm also neglecting something um, in the office because a simple thing like talking at a, uh, a meeting or going to a workshop or something like that 
is a full day out of the office. Um, so in terms of any tips to women that find it difficult to network or maybe that's not their thing, do you have maybe some tips for, for women that, you know, it's not really their thing or maybe they're introverts and they know they need to network but they don't really know what to do and how to do it? Yeah, it can be such a slimy sort of word and people, it's, so there's some real connotations involved with it. And I'd probably just say that there's no net, there's, again, like that typical path, there's no perfect way to network and I think you've just got to pick a style of, of building relationships that works with your personality. So if something like going to a workshop and, and drumming up small chat with people over a cup of tea afterwards leaves you feeling cold, well, don't do it. Um, you know, there might be times where you have to put your big girl pants on and do it, but don't make that your core way of building relationships because chances are you're probably pretty bad at it if you don't like it and it doesn't and it leaves you feeling a bit cold. You're probably not approaching it um, with all of your all of your heart and soul and not giving off your best self. So is your better way to do it to join a small business group where you're creating those relationships? Is it to um, just reach out to one person that you really admire and on, on email and just say, you know, I really, um, this is something that I'm not fantastic at, but I really appreciate where you come from and um, I'm not sure what I can, you know, do to help you, but do you mind if we um, start a, a bit of a relationship in a mentoring capacity or, um, you know, there's a lot of, I guess, don't hear the word networking and think that means you have to go to conferences with a deck of 500 freshly printed business cards and go and start this cold, awkward chat with people. There's lots of different ways to do it and just find a way that feels genuine for you and you don't feel like you're compromising your um, personality and your values by doing it. You mentioned the word mentorship. What's your view on mentorship and the importance of it um, in really developing the entrepreneurial journey? Yeah, critical. Every single step of my path for what I've done every single way I have had a mentor and a business coach um, and that might take total different forms a couple of, most of the time my business coach is paid um, but there's been a few times where I've had unpaid ones um, and in mentoring has a quite a broad um, definition for me I have been in formal mentoring relationships ad hoc mentoring relationships and Mentoring relationships that I like to call, like they might be more like a girl crush, you know, someone that you just really admire and um, think they've got a great outlook or a really good head on their shoulders and it might be someone that you just call up and say, look, do you mind if I meet you here and I'll shout you lunch but I'd love to just catch up and run some of my ideas by you. Or I think that is a form of mentoring in, in my, by my definition and um probably one of the most valuable ones. Mm -hmm. So I think of mentoring as a, as, a, as a network, as a bit of a brains trust that I have. So, and then, you know, I have a few people that I look to for different things and um, I, I just don't understand. I, I personally don't think there's any way to grow or to, to continually improve and to grow and be better at what you're doing without some form of mentoring. Okay, so let's move on a little bit to, to strategies. And um, you obviously um, build a lot of what you do around the virtual space. Can you maybe talk a little bit about what strategies you found uh, work really well for you? Uh, in, in the online space in terms of... In the uh, online the space, general, generally, and in an on, and the online space, yeah. Uh, for relationships or business sort Both. of stuff? Sorry, mm -hmm. so, yeah. Um, uh, well, some strategies. Um, I have a few networks that I hold very dear and I ensure my membership's always updated for those and I connect in with those groups. Um, I am constantly allocating a certain, and I, and I allocate it for two different reasons, um, allocate a certain portion of my week to research. And that is for two reasons. One, because research is critical to sort of see what's coming up, particularly in my line of work. I like to consider that there's a certain element in our comms and, and digital agency of, of futurist kind of work, you know, so I need to know what's around the corner all the time. Um, and and people, my clients rely on me to, to be that if they've heard of something and they're wondering what it's about, they rely on me to be across it. So 
I allocate research time for that amount, but I also allocate an amount of time because I can get lost in it too. So I allocate it to limit myself as well because you can spend all week just, um, you know, surfing around and researching cool things and not getting anything done. But um, I'm a big planner, um, as I mentioned earlier in the piece. So I have, an, a, um, I've tried just about every calendar and diary, um, you know, calendar, diary, notebook combo out there. Um, and I've sort of, I think for now, I've settled on a little system that works for me. And that's, a, a, you know, a combination of a 90-day plan um, action, you know, sort of system that keeps me ensuring that every day I've taken one step forward. And I think when you're in a business where you can feel a bit overwhelmed, that gives me a certain sense of clarity to be able to know that, I've got my five-year goal set out and then I've got my 12-year and then I've broken, I'm 12 months rather, and then I've broken that 12 month into 90-day sprint or 90-day sort of stints. And that 90-day, um, you know, that just ensures that every day I'm taking one step forward. And then um, I have a, you know, a thing, a, a brain dump, you know, book, a bullet journal, brain dump book. And that's really good for me to make sure that I'm, I'm getting ideas down and because otherwise it can get all a little bit lost in, up in my head and um, it, I can feel very overwhelmed. So a lot of my systems and strategies are in place to fight my feeling of overwhelm um, and also for some reason fight my feeling that I need to do everything today. So if I can get it down in there, I can make it part of my five-year plan and I know that it's in the plan and I'll get to it. But if I'm not doing it today, I'm not, you know, disappointing myself. Um, so that's probably some of those, you know, that sort of systemized of my, you know, bringing that vision down to goals, down to actions, down to daily, daily habits. Um, and probably on daily habits too, I, I find that when I do have habits, I perform a million times better. So um, something that I do in varying degrees, I'm pretty rubbish at it at the moment, um, but it's something I need to, I'm working on at the moment is try and establish good daily habits and just create nice um, rhythm around you so that the good stuff can happen. Um, and that's probably my, and then I try and, um, like I said earlier, I can get really lost in, in my little office here in Theodore um, and not take the time out to really connect in with my my mentors and my my group of support like you know my group that I like to lean to and I like to also I find inspiration and energy in what they're doing so I really like to make sure and this is my current goal and this night my 90 days that I'm, I've just started I really want to make sure that once a month I'm taking some time to build in some time to meet with those people and have a bit of a nice dinner or something with someone that I really admire and making sure we have a chat about that because I'm often um, going to Brisbane, say, for something, a board meeting or work, and I'm so focused on making sure that I'm away from home the smallest amount possible because I'm, I've got young kids and a husband and a farm and I don't want to put extra pressure on that system and I want to make sure I'm always putting, you know, putting them first and balancing out all the other bits of guilt we put on ourselves um, so I'm always rushing there and rushing back, um, even if that means, you know, arriving in the garage at midnight that night, I was still home that day, you know, and I'm there when everyone wakes up in the morning, when really if I had actually taken that night and come home the next morning and taken that night to have dinner with a couple of people or catch up with a, a, a valued mentor or a potential business contact, I would have got great value from that. So, um but that all comes with planning. Well, I think all of those that you mentioned are really kind of good tools to use. Um, would there be uh, one or two online tools that work really well for you? Mm, I'm a massive um, fan of the Google Suite and the Google Calendar, yeah. and I, I keep everything. If it's not on there, it doesn't happen. And I, I recently actually had a bit of a detox because I could subscribe. I like to try every digital tool that's out there and just see what's going to work for me. A little bit like trying every paper, di every you know diary system that's out there. Um, I certainly like to use project management tools like Asana. Um, I'm currently using Asana. I had a look at going over to um, Basecamp for a while there, but um, I, I'm, I think I'm going to stick with Asana probably just purely from a costing model. It's cheaper. Um, and then I also use things like, you know, Buffer and Co-Schedule and those sorts of things to get my content um, planned out in advance so that 
And that's uh, that's something for me in this 90-day sprint that I'm at the moment is um, getting that content put ahead of time so that I'm taking that pressure off myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but having everything talk to each other, spending a bit of time so that your inbox can be sent straight to tasks in Asana and into your Google Calendar, um, those sorts of things, and colour coding my calendar. That's been the that's my um, sanity right there. What about social media? Um, what would what you find or what could you, uh, you know, what would your advice be as to in terms of social media that's working really well for you? Yeah, social media is, I have a relationship with social media. Um, I, I enjoy, I mean, it's the, the reach and what you can do on social media is just unmatched. Like it's, it's such an important business tool now. Um, you know, Facebook for business has just been an absolute game changer. Um, so it's, I, I know it's a necessary evil uh, for me just because I, I guess I, I can find it frivolous sometimes. I can spend a lot of time forecasting out all my social media content, but I haven't actually created anything that is um, what I would define a piece of work. Um, so I use, that's where I use Buffer and Co-Schedule so that I, I can spend a day writing content and schedule it all into that so that it's, it goes out without me being on there and goes out at the appropriate time. Um, I've been experimenting and I also probably recommend the biggest thing that's helped me with managing my social media and business as well is, um, this is probably a little bit left of where you were heading, Risa, but Um, podcasts uh, are Mm -hmm. massive we spend so much time in the car and a third you know a little drive where you can sneak in a fantastic quick podcast on how to you know best run a Facebook group or something like that is um is really great or doing that on my morning walk is um really good for me so I find that a really um a a critical tool really the um, podcasts for me um and social media Look, I'm across, I'm on everything. I'm just actually looking up on my wall. I've got a calendar sitting there with my schedule on Mondays. This happens on this platform and this platform. Wednesdays is on Facebook pages, this post, but then Twitter I do something different, you know, so um, schedule it out as much as you can so you don't find yourself doing this ad hoc time syncing social media stuff. What would your biggest overall lesson be that you've learned and that you can kind of share with with the rest of us? Jeez. Um, Biggest lesson that I've learned is, well, I guess your ideas um, don't mean jack unless you're going to do something with them. Uh, without sounding too crass, but, you know, I remember one of my earlier mentors telling me that he'd forgotten better ideas than I'd ever had. And that was, um, I'm like, yeah, he's probably right. So, you know, I, I've had a lot of ideas over time, but that wasn't what made me an entrep- entrepreneur or a businesswoman or let me contribute to my family. It was what I did with those ideas. Um, so I guess the biggest thing I'd say to people is um, if you've got the idea, that's great. Pick the one that's been following you around and won't leave you alone and the one that just keeps bugging you and put the right people around you um, early in the piece. If you've got some people that making you, you know, you walk away from the conversation and it's making you feel a bit heavy or a bit negative or all of a sudden you're walking away with a few doubts about your idea, we'll just quite simply quarantine them from your life <laughs> um, unless it's your your family, I suppose, but, you know, you've really got to put right the right people around you and get that right um, ecosystem, I guess, for, for all of this to take place. So um, invest your time heavily in people that um, are a positive influence around you um, and, and pick the idea that's been bugging you the most and also just go at it and go hard and then you'll know really quickly whether it's got legs or not. And if it doesn't have legs, it's no big deal. Just um, roll on to the next thing. Uh, Fleur, what about partnerships? What's your view on partnerships? Yeah, I'm, um, I guess it's all horses for courses with partnerships and depending on your business and what you set out to achieve. I I wouldn't, um, you know, I've had a couple of people ask me about that in in different things um, where they've had um, someone approach them about being a partner in their business. And I guess I always say to them, well, what was your reason for 
starting this business or what's your end goal? Um, and are you taking on this partner simply for a cash flow struggle or to help you achieve your end goal? So um, I always just sort of, you know, be careful with who you're going to wake up with in the morning um, and that a partnership is something that can be a fantastic, you know, can ta take you absolutely to the next level in your business and really, um, you know, there's that African problem if you want to go, you know, go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I'm a big, I, I, I work better in a team. I work better with other people. I work better with, but that doesn't mean that I need to take on a partner. There's a lot of ways of working with other people and increasing the strength without taking a partnership on. Um, so enter with caution. But if you think that there's a partnership there that aligns values wise and aligns with um, the end goal isn't too, isn't compromised, then um, yeah, go for it. A second last question, um, you know, you're already doing some amazing things in, in this space for rural women and with rural women. Um, but if you think about maybe into the future, um, what would be uh, maybe one amazing thing that you would like to do still in the future? Oh, there's so many things I would like to do. And in fact, when, um, when people say, you know, oh, you've done some great things, um, you know, all fluttery slight in my mind I'm thinking oh well there's way better things in ahead you just wait like there's so much more to do um, and that's probably a bit of a curse of the entrepreneur too you're never really quite satisfied with where you are because you're constantly looking at yourself 10 years down the track um, or where, what you're working towards um, and we probably don't spend enough time celebrating the wins along the way um, What's some things that I'm really looking forward to in the future? Look, I'm really looking forward to seeing where Rural Business Collective can go. I think it's got a huge amount of potential um, to be a, a, a real absolute support um, tool. And, and I say tool because I'd like to see it grow from a network to being a tool. And I think that, um, you know, we're currently at the last snapshot of our first sort of 100 days, we did a little um, cost analysis there and we you know, we think we can return people four to one on their on their dollar for their membership, um, whereas I'd like to see that ten to one. Um, I'd like to see people, you know, you know, if I said to you I'll give you a dollar and you'll give me ten or you give me a dollar and I'll give you ten back, you'll do that every day of the week. And that's what I would like to see Rural Business Collective get to. So that's certainly a big focus for me going forward. Um, and then I'd also like to see some sort of, um, a broadening of, of our, I think we've seen some great things in how we raise capital and how we um, facilitate or help people start their business in removing barriers to business. I'd like to see some things that can really do be involved in something that can really remove a massive barrier to business and whether that's, um, you know, we started Rural Business Collective on a crowdfunding platform, which is something that we couldn't have ever done, you know, five years ago, I don't think. Um, so that was cool, but I'd like to be involved in something for tapping into probably my past with experience in philanthropy as well. You know, is there some sort of angel investment kind of thing we can really launch here for rural businesses? Um, yeah. Who knows? But watch this space. But there's certainly the areas that I'm really keeping my eye on. Um, Flea, where can uh, we uh, and other women out there connect with you online? Oh, yeah. Well, um, uh, on, on Facebook at um, Rural Business Collective um, and certainly on Twitter at just um, at Fleur Anderson, or one word, F-L-E-U-R. Um, and then anyone can, you know, email me or call me at any time. I think you, hopefully there'll be some opportunity to put some links or something like that with this interview. But um, Fleur at thecahootsgroup.com.au, um, flick me an email at any time, find me on LinkedIn. I'm across all the platforms, so just get in touch in any of those ways. Okay, fantastic. Um, Flea, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I think, um, you know, just listening to you, there's so many, I guess, gold nuggets that came from that, um, just for myself, even listening to you, it's like, yeah, that's, that's, that's so true. And yeah, that's so true. <laughs> so, um, yeah, looking forward to connect with you further also on the WIRE program, um, you know, because I think, um, you know, women like yourself is really making a difference in the rural space um, because you're doing it every day, but you're also helping other women to do it every day so yeah looking forward to connecting with you in the future again um, on the in the Y program and um, thank you very much for your time today
Thanks, Teresa. And I, I, I really like the, the concept of the WIRE program with women sort of helping each other along the way. I think without someone, you know, give, you give someone a leg up, they give you a leg up. That's how it all um, happens. So all the best with it and I look forward to being engaged along the way.